GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. Hey guys, I'm Felissa Rose Angela from Sleepaway Camp, and you're listening to the All Better Off with a Robbie Vegas podcast. What's up, Rock Soldiers? This is the rock star, Robbie Vegas, and you know how we do it here. It's another brand new episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. Thank you guys for joining me once again today, and we have Tony Hudson with us today, which I'm super excited about. Uh, you, all my horror listeners, know her from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3, came out in 1990, but uh, we're going to dig into her career as a whole, uh, other horror movies, and, of course, appearances on some really popular 80s television shows, which um, I'm pretty excited to ask her about. So I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to get Tony on the line. And please make sure you are following the All Bets Are Off podcast across the board on social media at ABAOPod. Once again, that's on every platform. All right, guys, let's get Tony on the line. Hey, everybody. This is Lauren Marie Taylor, creator and host of the Not The Final Girl podcast. Okay, so every horror fan remembers the final girl, right? You know, the one who can outrun and outsmart the Jasons, the Michaels, the Chuckies. I think you get it. But what about the girls and, yeah, the guys who met with an untimely end? Those of us who were tortured and tripped, dragged and killed. Don't we deserve some props? As Vicky in Friday the 13th Part 2 and Sheila in Girls' Night Out, I know what a drag it is to succumb to those masked and wardrobe-challenged killers to not be the final girl. On my new podcast, I'll be chatting with other women of horror who share the same fate. Special guests include those final girls as well as the writers and directors who created our characters, only to give us an early expiration date. And if they play nice... We'll let some of those crazed killers of horror tell their side of the story. So join me, Lauren Marie Taylor, on the Not the Final Girl podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you get the alerts when the episodes drop. Thanks for listening. Keep your doors locked and stay out of the woods. doing okay i'm doing great awesome good to hear thank you so much for doing this i appreciate it yeah no it's nice to be a, a part of the community you know yeah absolutely well i want to take this back as far as we can go because i want to know what age uh you decided that you wanted to be an actress to begin with i think it was really young probably i started off dancing at four years old my grandmother had a dance studio and taught little girls tap and ballet. My mother was an only child, was kind of like raised a Shirley Temple. And so um, I was raised around dance and dance always had recitals, which was performing. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up around that and I had that kind of in me. And then I would watch TV and go, I want to do that or I want to do that. And my mother would be doing the dishes with her back to me. And she said, well, give him a call and tell him. <laughs> so I just. I just started looking in the back of magazines and I called up Teen Magazine and told them that I wanted to be in it. And they said, well, send us some pictures. So I had done some uh, pictures for Photography Magazine and I sent those in and they said, come on down. <laughs> so I went down to Teen Magazine. They did a whole photo shoot and I was in the Christmas issue that year. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So that kind of started like, well, I just wanted to do that. I called him up and I went and did it. And then, and then I got married really young and I was playing racquetball because there was racquetball facilities that I was managing with the person I was with. And I got really good at it and started teaching. And I became an author of the sport at the age of 19. 
Oh, wow. And so they came through our racquetball facility uh, to shoot a commercial because we had a court that had a glass back wall. Mm -hmm. And it's really great to shoot commercials and things. So they needed someone to teach Peter Fonda how to play racquetball. So I got to be the one. Wow. And then they said, well, you're so good. Can we use you as a body double from the neck down and, you know, shoot you as the player that can play? And that started the bug. And, and then I went to a commercial workshop and, and then I just started. So it was really young, 15, 16 years old. Wow, that's incredible. And now I could have this wrong, but um, did you get like your first big breaks in TV and film in 1982 when you did Young Doctors in Love and um, Capital? Yeah, well, TV, TV happened to be, well, no, that's not true. I kind of did film. I did film out right out of the gate. Young Doctors in Love was like the first thing. And then uh, I started doing film, and then TV kind of came into it mm. a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple uh, things that you did for TV that I wanted to ask you about because they're iconic shows that people still remember now. And uh, one of them, you actually were in an episode of Knight Rider. Is that true? Mm -hmm. yes. How, what was that yeah, experience? Yeah, it was Oh, it was great. Um, in fact, I was just interviewed from the Knight Rider historians uh, on the episode that I'm in. The, the, the name of the episode is Knight by a Nose. Mm -hmm. And I play Michael Knight's ex-girlfriend who has horses and she has problems with her horses and thinks one is dead. So she asks him to help her. And so he comes back into her life. And it's a whole thing about my horse called King Jack. <laughs> that had to be such a cool experience too and like looking back on it it is one of the most iconic shows of all time and now you play a part in that and i said there was a few shows because you also had appearances on the a team and love boat and those are two other shows that are huge shows like i can go to the casino right now and they have a love boat machine you know like <laughs> yeah so like you know something like that like looking back on your career um when you were first getting going did you know that these were going to be such a big deal or were they already a big deal when you were doing these these spots yeah they were already kind of big i mean mm -hmm. the the producers that were doing those shows glenn larson and stevie J. cannell that did a lot of the tv shows that i guest starred on mm -hmm. um were a part of my circle you know because i was married to Dirk Benedict from the A-Team, and that was Stephen J. Cannell. Mm -hmm. So you had Knight Rider, Greatest American Hero, Love Boat, A-Team, um, what else? There was about three others, you know, mm -hmm. and then the soap operas, Capital and General Hospital and um, Young and the Restless. So there was a few. Okay. Um, but it was mostly film that I, that I ventured into. I didn't do as much television as film, even though, because when I started, television wanted girls with T and A. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And I was this all-American, not-so-T, and a little bit A. <laughs> so you find your way into movies, and then you get into horror, which is all about TNA, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, my part, C wasn't a TNA girl. Yeah, right, right. In, in, in Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Um, uh, mine was, uh, you know... I. Our storyline was two sisters who went through the certain area mm -hmm. and um, came across the Leatherface family, <laughs> the lovely family. And uh, I saw him eat my sister and use her face skin that had a teardrop tattoo sewn into his mask. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten away, so he didn't get to eat me. I had gotten away, and I was in the woods for 10 days, and they were chasing me, so the lead couple, Kate Hodges and the gentleman, I forget who plays the male lead, uh, were coming through with their car. So I helped save them a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And then and then the weekend warrior guy, Ken Foray, he, he's an amazing actor. Um, I come across him and I help him a little bit. But eventually I get chainsawed in half. So. <laughs> well, you know, again, going back to saying that you were part of such iconic things, now you're stepping into Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which by that point was very iconic. It was 1990 when you were doing Part 3, and Leatherface was already an icon of the horror genre. Were you a fan of the series? Or were you a fan of horror in general? Like, walk us through how you how you got into that movie. Was it just an audition that was that went right, or what, what happened there? A lot of yeses yeah. <laughs> to that. Um, well, basically, I'm not a horror a genre film fan. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't like them. I can watch them. I don't get grossed out. It's just not my. It's not my genre. Yeah. I'd rather do a you know a, a romantic story, a uplifting something. But a well made movie is a well made movie, and it is a genre people like. So you know, I have to respect the art and being a part of such a, a big 
big uh, franchise is really nice. Mm -hmm. It was just an audition. I auditioned right in the office uh, for Jeff Burr, Mm -hmm. the director, and the casting person. And um, I didn't tell them at the time because actresses don't really want to admit this, but I was pregnant. And I didn't want to tell them I was pregnant for fear they go, oh, well, she's pregnant. We can't have her you know, play this part that has to run through the woods. And I was in my first trimester. It was my second child. So I didn't figure it was any big deal. So I kept it a secret. (laughs) Anyway, I went into the office and I figured, how am I going to pretend I'm running in the woods in an office? It's Mm -hmm. like a little square box. Like, how do you create that world in an audition? So what I did was he was sitting behind the desk and I went in and I just went to the corner of the room as far away from and I just slumped down into the fetal position. He had to stand up over the desk to see me. Mm-hmm. And so I just did the scene in a fetal position in the corner on the floor. And um, so I got the part. <laughs> and right before we were going to shoot the scene where I get chased out in half by Leatherface, uh, I told them that I was pregnant, just in case. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> just in case they chainsawed you in half. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I think Jeff Burr uh, told that story in the laser disc version of the director's commentary. And um, but yeah, no, that was a really fun movie. In fact, I was just in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. at the uh, Pennsylvania Horror Con. Oh yes. Yeah, and film festival. And R. A. who plays Leatherface was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was really great. Well, let's let's talk about conventions here for a second. So, first thing, are you a f- more of a fan of horror now? Um, you know, since doing Texas Chainsaw, and and obviously your popularity must continue to resurface every time they do a new movie in the franchise because everybody likes to go back and watch the old ones, right? So, do you see that yeah. happening for yourself? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the genre, and I I could make a horror film too. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, I'd have to have some lesson or some story, <laughs> you know. <that> <laughs> Um, but I like scary movies. I think I like scary and suspense more than horror and, mm-hmm. and bloody, you know, there's, so there's, cause there's different types within the genre of the genre. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I, I totally respect the art form cause making a good one is, is not easy. Cause there's a lot of like this one I did called uninvited, you know, forgive me, Michael Farkas who made the movie, but you know, it's just a cheesy horror film. Mm-hmm. But there's people who love cheesy horror films. In fact, I went to a thing where they heckled the film. That's part of it. You pay money to sit in the audience and be the best heckler and make comments and bad <laughs> things about the movie. And I went to one of these yeah. for Uninvited and then spoke at the end. It was the, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. So it's a really great... The people that like the genre are great. And you, you actually made that before you made Texas Chainsaw. That was in 1987, right? So, I mean... I I mean I I enjoy the movie because it's cheesy and I like all kinds of horror but like you said with the heckling like that's kind of why we we enjoy horror hosts like Elvira or Joe Bob Briggs because they take movies that are bad and they make them fun to watch and it becomes yeah. a good movie in that that vein and I think a lot of us who grew up on Elvira and hosts like that enjoy those movies for that reason and I I think you know Uninvited was fun for that reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean the killer cat, rah, you know. Right. <laughs> and George Kennedy and Georgia Kennedy, oh, you know, the blood <laughs> from the. I mean, yeah. and they're sitting there pumping it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the first time I saw Uninvited, I was really, I was little because, I mean, I was born in 87. So right, okay. the, the first time I saw that movie, I was, I was little, little kid and um, it scared me. But like, you know, now when I watch it, I watch it and I laugh and I have fun with it. And I think it's a yeah. fun movie. So I wanted to ask you about it and your experience with it. So, you know, obviously there was that three year gap in between the two, but you did audition for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So there must have been a part of you that was like, I could do another horror movie. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that, yeah, it was somebody, a casting director I knew and needed somebody. Mm-hmm. And um, I came in kind of last minute. I think someone, I think they had hired somebody, they fell out. And so I was, I came in with four girls or something at the end and, and they, they hired me. And um, I was pregnant with my uh, first child mm-hmm. <laughs> in the first trimester during that one. So while we were on the boat, yeah. talk about queasiness in your first trimester, being oh, nauseous. Man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was a straight audition from somebody that had requested me and I came in and, and then I had to learn a little bit about boats, you know, cause mm-hmm. I supposed to own this boat mm-hmm. and, uh, great. It was a fun, great cast. It was really, really a great cast really uh, cool. of people. And then, and then, um, my ex Dirk Benedict from the A-Team mm-hmm. 
the face man, he came and stayed on the boat, like, and, you know, because we stayed around the Queen Mary like, oh, okay. thing yeah, yeah. down there. And um, we stayed in that port. It was fun. Oh, it was that's... a fun, in fact, at the same time in Long Beach, we were in Long Beach down there by the Queen Mary. Uh, was Gary Marshall directing Goldie Hawn on the overboard. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. That's another great movie. Mm-hmm. Little tidbit. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> Trivia. What, uh, do you remember uh, about when you started doing conventions? I don't do them often. I'd, I'd love to do them more. It's oh, so okay. fun. In fact, I'm usually like the last person they're trying to get to fill a cast <laughs> on their poster or something because they because the other ones go to more often to different places. Uh, so yeah, I'm usually filling up their poster as the last one, you know. So, oh wow! Okay. <laughs> I did that a lot over the over the weekend. Mm-hmm. What uh, what year about did you start doing those? Was it more recently? Um, no, I've done them for the past on and off for the past seven eight years. Oh okay, okay, excellent. Mm-hmm. So I got to ask because every time I get a horror actor or actress on my show, I need to know this. And um, I, I'm stealing this question from my friend, Lauren Marie Taylor, from Friday the 13th, Part 2. And okay. uh, she likes to ask this, and it made me start to ask this. What is the craziest thing that you've ever had to sign? What do you mean? Oh, sign? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what it is. I want to hear it. Well, I don't know if it's crazy. I mean, like, okay, so over the weekend, I just was in Pennsylvania. So mm-hmm. I signed, someone had custom made a leather face apron. Oh, of wow. fake skin. Yeah. Right. And it had kind of a face that was like, <laughs> like in the skin, you know. Yeah. And I signed Sarah like I was screaming in the mouth. <laughs> oh, that's great. I like that. Um, and then someone had from an old, old Blockbuster video store, mm-hmm. they had a pop-up display of a, a saw going through something poster leather face it was something something that they had found oh wow another person had a big uh picture another picture made poster of a personal poster made mm-hmm. you know th- they bring things that you've never seen before yeah. usually that's that's what's unique mm-hmm. do you get people at horror conventions that will bring you things to sign from other movies you've done that are not horror movies Oh, yeah. Yeah? What's, what's oh, yeah. probably the I most I get a lot popular? of Just One of the Guys. Oh, just really? One of the guys. Very cool. Just One of the Guys was, I mean, you were born in 87, mm-hmm. right? So the movie came out in 85. Mm-hmm. So you had to be a teenager in 85 to really know this movie. But it was a coming-of-age teenage flick, and it was just that genre, of, you know, in that, in, in that 80s. So it has a very big 80s cult following. Huge. Oh yeah, that's a great movie. Um, I wanted to bring it up, so I'm glad that you did. Because to me, that's one of those movies that falls in line with like, um, you know, the other great teen movies of the '80s, like Sixteen Candles and Breakfast Club and all that stuff. That's yeah, it's in that's that in little there. window, yes. right? And I mm-hmm. think that's so great that you were a part of that. So that's cool to hear that people are remembering and and bringing that stuff out. Are you signing what is it like movie posters, like DVDs, stuff like that for that movie? Yeah, everything. And then, of course, I have 8x10s that I bring that are from all the different ones that I that I know that people like, their favorites, and I'll usually have them available besides people's, you know, DVD covers, posters, and other things, mm-hmm. T-shirts, you know, shorts. <laughs> yeah, you've done some iconic things, and, like, that, that movie specifically, was that just another audition that went well? Is that how you got that one? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Interestingly enough, the girl who played Deborah Strobridge, the prom queen. Yes. Okay. Well, she and I became besties after that movie, through our entire lives. And what's ironic is there was another movie I did called Places in the Heart that Sally Field won her Academy Award, where, where she says, you love me, you love me, as she's saying her speech, and comedians made fun of her forever. Mm-hmm. That's That movie, Places in the Heart, Deborah was living in New York, I was in L.A., mm. and it was between her and me. Mm. We didn't know each other. She finds out I get it in L.A. Mm-hmm. And moments later, she finds out she gets a part in a movie where I'm in the movie with her. So she's going to come meet the girl that got the movie she didn't get. <laughs> And I'm wondering who was the girl in New York, you know, because they told me it was between me and a girl in New York. Yeah. And uh, so then we ended up being on this movie together and became besties. I was at the birth of her child. She was at the birth of mine. We vacation. And yeah, we're still, she's a, she's a very established author right now. 
Oh, excellent. Very cool. You know, I, I think it's interesting, too, that, um, you know, yourself or, like, Darcy DeMoss, who was in um, Friday the 13th Part 6, did, like, Can't Buy Me Love. And um, these are also, like, iconic movies from a totally different genre, and you guys are a part of both. And I find that just so cool and, and fascinating, because a lot of the times horror movie actors, maybe prior to the 80s, but would, they would get typecast and only do horror movies. And you guys <laughs> did everything and i i just think that's really awesome even with the like you said general hospital and things like that like soap operas a lot of you have done soap operas and i just that's amazing to me now do you find yourself um enjoying making film more than tv or soap operas or things like that good question i think as a younger younger artist you know i, I i'm of age now <laughs> in case you didn't know yeah you're like 31 31 yeah. yeah almost double that so i was close is what you're saying yeah, no, I'm 61, actually. But, uh, no, I mean, the difference, okay, because back in the day, uh, a soap actor did not do primetime television, mm-hmm. and a primetime television actor did not do film. Gotcha. It just, it was separated. It started to dissolve once you had the HBO and the streaming, you had movies on TV. Yeah. Right? So it started to blend in. Now you have famous movie stars doing commercials. Because they get a big doll. So it's all blending. It doesn't matter anymore. I would say when you're younger, traveling the world and being, you know, on location for a very long time, you're not married, you don't have kids yet. That's more fun. It's less stress on your personal life. Mm -hmm. But if you like that and you're a vagabond, making movies is really great. A family comes together for six weeks to three months and and, and you come together and you rely on each other. And you don't have Mm -hmm. your regular laundry staring at you or your bills sitting on the desk. You know, the maid comes in and cleans your room. It's, it's a different world, mm-hmm. which is why affairs are always happening on set, because real life isn't part of it. Um, uh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then they leave the movies all done, and then they all go home, and it's like, wait, I have to go to the gym, and I have to do my laundry, and I have to go, and it's like, wait, it wasn't like we were isolated. So that's what happens a lot. But, I, I mean, I like movies. Mm-hmm. I'm a movie maker. I mean, I'm, I'm about, I mean, I produced my first movie, Charlie's Christmas Wish in Georgia a couple of years ago. As I, and I also star in it. The dog is my dog. I, I trained mm. the dog. The kid's my kid. Oh, <laughs> wow. Know, excellent. I produced. I set to decorate it. So really hands-on. Learned that whole side of it. And I'm going to be doing a lot more of that. I've just written a script called Living on the Fringe, which is a full-length feature. I'm in post-production on a documentary called um, My Journey with Joy. Mm. which is a man's journey uh, of grief and loss of losing his wife. And it's really beautiful, the journey he's taken to Sedona and his inner journey to become okay with being by himself. And uh, so that's a lot of, that's in post-production and editing. And uh, my third book is about to come out. It's called Tinder Love. It's based on um, fantasy diary dates like Tinder. <laughs> that's awesome well wow, you are a busy busy woman now yeah i, I gotta ask you about the um the the christmas movie though because i love christmas movies so uh it just it's crazy that you said that was your your first one right that, that i produced yes. yes the first movie that you produced was a christmas movie so why is that are you just a huge like lover of christmas or you just had a great idea and had to roll with it what was that Oh, that was because my producing partner on that product project was Sue Ann Taylor. Sue Ann Taylor lives in Georgia from uh, Maine, but lived in Georgia a long time. And she's a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. We met at the American Film Market in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. And I was producing four movies and selling and stuff. And we got introduced to each other and she was selling her thing. And we met. And then... We decided to produce a movie called The Poet Together, which Mm -hmm. I think is still getting made, not by us, but it's a great project. I'm still rooting it on. But what happened was, is we decided to make a handful of movies. We went to the AFM the next year together as a producing team. As Mm -hmm. we're there, we lost a movie, like, that we could even sell. Like, they took it away from us. Oh, wow. So, oh, boom, we had four movies we were selling. Now we only have three, so we had, like, an open window. Mm -hmm. And as we were meeting with different buyers they were saying do you have a family christmas dog homeless veteran movie you have a you have a christmas movie you have a dog movie you have a they kept asking for something we didn't have yeah so that first day at the market we went home and she went to sleep with my dog okay Charlie, yeah which is right here Charlie, come here. <laughs> and uh, ah he's the star it's actually a she and that it's a he yeah she's oh. she's got a boy name like me tony charlie oh very anyway cool. so so she wakes up with charlie uh-huh. And she goes, Charlie, 
you want to make a movie? <laughs> <laughs> and so I get up in the morning. She goes, I have an idea. Why don't we just make Christmas family dog movie? Mm-hmm. Like, you have the dog. You're an actor. You know all these other actors. And she goes, I can raise the money. We'll write the thing. So we just, that's, it just came out of an idea that we lost a movie during the American film market in Santa Monica. We had an open window. They kept requesting that mm-hmm. and we can manifest that. She lives in a very small town, 40 minutes north of Atlanta. And it's like a Norman Rock- Rockwell little town. So we just took the dog and she wrote the script down and we fine tuned it and hired some friends and family and made it happen mm-hmm. raised some money <laughs> awesome and where can we watch this and then, movie? And it, came, it came out by lionsgate uh distributed for us oh very cool and where is it streaming somewhere right now or yeah you can amazon prime pure flicks at least through the hall i mean i hope it's still there i haven't looked lately but yeah it's usually available there awesome very cool i need to check that out like i said i'm a, i'm big into horror movies and christmas movies isn't that a weird combo is that is see, see? <laughs> well let me let me tie it back into texas chainsaw here before i start wrapping it up with you because i know no. my my listeners are like yeah tell us more about that so how long were you on set when you were filming texas chainsaw because you said it could be anywhere from you know six weeks to three months so how long were, were you guys on set for that you know, funny and ironically enough, R.A., who plays Leatherface uh, in the movie, we were talking about it in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. because Jennifer, who played the little girl, mm-hmm. the creepy little girl, yes. she was also there in Pennsylvania, oh. and she's all grown up. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen her since she was, what, eight? Right. Anyway, so uh, I was trying to think, well, I never saw Jennifer on set because all of her scenes were in the house, mm-hmm. and all of my scenes were in the woods. Right, right. So all I worked with was Ken Fourier, the Kate, and the other guy, and R.A., mm-hmm. really. My stuff was all in the woods outside. So I would say three or four days is, oh, wow. is my shoot, and maybe three of them consecutive, and then one other day I was brought back, to, you know, to pick up shots and stuff. Wow. A lot okay. of running, a lot <laughs> of running, a lot of breathing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, did you find it hard to uh, get into that mindset, or, you know, once you were out there, was it easy to be basically scared like were you ever actually scared no no so you're just Never. that good at coming off that way because you did a great job <laughs> did, I, did i look terrified yes <laughs> i mean dude here's here's the thing first of all they they put the the fake holes in the blood mm-hmm. so you got that right and yeah. so you're, you're like <laughs> and then you've got the gash and you got the blood and they mess up your clothes and so all you gotta do is look in the mirror first and foremost there's your inspiration you right know? Right. Makeup and hair department and wardrobe, and you look there, and you go, "Boy, you look like you, sh- you look like shit, man." <laughs> then, then you have lines that yep. you have to say, which are not a lot. But then you have a situation you have to play out. So, as an actor, what's really great, okay, is we're given license mm-hmm. to be over the top and extreme. Mm. And because if you're a normal person in an office, you can't do that. If you feel like screaming and yelling because it just feels good to get out of your system, you just, oh, 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 they would think you, they would lock you up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but as an actor, you're given, here, okay, I want you to pretend that you're running in the woods and this guy with that thing is chasing you. How easy you just go, I get to let go. I get to, like, go. <laughs> and let, let off, like, the human valve of stress and anger and pain every kind of fear and thing that i can ever imagine and just let put it there oh that's awesome oh uh, well it's like therapy <laughs> yeah, right right now do you have like maybe you do maybe you don't but do you have uh, a favorite scene from that movie like a favorite kill scene or just scene in general oh for of, that i did or just the, in the, the, movie? the movie in general yeah oh no, I would say my favorite stuff is with Ken Foray in the in the woods where I'm talking with him mm-hmm. and we share a smoke. Yep, yep. And the way I throw him the lighter and the, the the whole the whole exchange where he doesn't know what's going on and I've been exposed for a few days now, ten days. I'm like, and he has no idea. And the contrast of those two characters sitting in the woods hearing shit, yeah. you know, and yeah. It was that. That was the most fun. That those scenes. Do you remember what it was like when you first saw the completed movie for the first time? What was going through your head when you actually watched uh, Texas Chainsaw Three? Yeah, I had no idea. I, in fact, a little tidbit for any of you, and, and he wouldn't care that I share this, but Dirk Benedict, I was married to him at the time when they had the cast and crew screening, mm-hmm. and I think it was in Westwood. It was like a really nice situation, 
And I think we get to the part where they're in the kitchen and they're starting to eat and mm-hmm. cook and do all that. And Dirk got up and left. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> He said, uh, I'm out of here. <laughs> I like paused for a moment waiting for like what was coming next. And then I realized what you said and was like, oh, <laughs> no, he just left. And, and of course, it's in the middle of the movie. So everyone saw that he left. Whoever's behind us saw that he left. Yeah, you know? right, right. Oh, my God. That's that's too funny. All right. Here's here's a fun question for you. Um, is there any movie that you haven't done that you wish you can go back in time and be a part of? I'm talking any genre, any decade anything at all if if i said if there's a movie that you could star in right now what would you pick well there's a few that i auditioned for mm. that i get that became big hits oh okay there's a movie called footloose oh wow you auditioned for footloose mm-hmm. that is awesome it was between it was between her and me we would go in and out in and out with joel schumacher the director and, mm-hmm. and uh they it just yeah just trying to figure out which girl which girl and um, and ironically enough, in the script, we didn't get the script. We got sides. Like, we didn't get the whole script ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we got it at the last minute, and I'm reading it. And the only pair of cowboy boots I owned were a pair of red Ralph Lauren cowboy boots that I had purchased for myself. And in the script, those were her character boots, were red cowboy boots. So mm-hmm. I show up at my callback, callback, callback in my red cowboy boots, and she shows up being a wild and that's what the girl was so she got the part wow that is really cool is there another one you can you audition for that you can tell us about we just so i can you know call up the casting directors and bitch oh dude no no okay so here okay you want want to hear a tom cruise story absolutely okay so i there was a famous casting director lynn stallmaster if you look him up on imdb and see all the movies that he cast you know oh wow he's cast a lot of famous movies mm-hmm. And one of his associates was a woman named Tony Howard, who was an assistant casting director. Mm-hmm. And then they had a casting associate named Gail Eisenstadt. Gail Eisenstadt had brought me in as a young 19-year-old actress to read for her to so, see how I was. Yeah. I, she said I was the best actor she'd ever seen with a cold reading. I'm going to bring you back. No, he, she brought Tony Howard, the woman Tony Howard, in. Mm-hmm. I read for her again. The two of them said, we want you to come back and read these sides. It was a movie that Paul Newman was starring in. And directing. It was called Harry and Son. And I was to read for the girlfriend of the son. So I prepare. And then I'm going for this callback, callback, callback. And I'm reading for Paul now. This is like the fourth or fifth callback. Mm-hmm. And it's on a Saturday. The office is, it's a sky rise. And centuries, it's closed. Except for I'm sitting in this waiting room. And there's no reception. There's nobody. And they call me in. And there's Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's in the corner, his wife doing Needlepoint, mm-hmm. uh, Lynn Slaw Master, Tony Howard, and another person, a producer, and Paul. So they chit-chat a little bit. I was so nervous because it was these people. It was an eight-page dramatic scene, and I read, and they say, thank you for coming in, and I leave. And as I leave, there's this guy sitting in the waiting room, and we kind of nod as two actors like, hey, good luck. Kinda. And I leave, mm-hmm. I go down the hall and push the elevator button. And Tony Howard opens the door and says, hey, Tony, you still there? And I went, yeah. She goes, would you mind reading with this young actor that we brought in from New York? And she goes, Tony, this is Tom, Tom, this is Tony. So on a handshake, mm-hmm. no rehearsal, we go into this room to read for Paul and everybody. An eight-page dramatic boyfriend and girlfriend scene where he got me pregnant. We haven't seen each other. We run into each other at the grocery store. I drop a bag of groceries, and now we have an eight pages of dialogue. Mm. So we, we do this scene. There's not a dry eye in the room. Everybody's crying. Joanne Woodward has definitely stopped her needlepoint. <laughs> we end the scene forehead to forehead, and, and he whispers in my ear, you read better than anybody I read with in New York. And then we kind of sit down, and Paul chats with us. We still don't remember it to this day. Mm-hmm. And then we leave. And then they say thank you, and we leave. And, and we walk out, and we end up going downstairs. It's Pico Boulevard. And we go across the street to Love's Barbecue Pit. It used to be a very famous restaurant. Mm-hmm. And we went and had coffee for four hours. There's two young actors that just had this audition with Paul Newman and Lynn Stallmaster, the casting person. Wow, wow, wow. Now, at this time, Tom Cruise had a movie that had come out called Taps. Uh-huh. Risky business he had shot, but it was in the can. Gotcha. It had not come out yet. So he was just Tom Cruise, a young actor, trying to do his thing. I'm Tony Hudson, doing my thing. 
Well, n- neither of us get this movie. Oh, wow. Tom Cruise doesn't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. They ended up hiring Robbie Benson to play the son mm-hmm. and Ellen Barkin, who had just come off Diner, to play the girlfriend. And the reason was because Paul was directing mm-hmm. and he was insecure to have two young new actors play the part mm-hmm. instead of these mature more seasoned actors, since he was directing, he was insecure. So he went with them instead of us. Well, ironically enough, two weeks later, I'm sitting at um, the Fox commissary after an audition, and Tony Howard, that assistant casting director, comes walking to my table. I'm by myself having lunch after an audition. Mm -hmm. And she proceeds to tell me that I came, and she put her fingers as close together as she could without (laughs) touching. She said, you came this close to getting the part, and we told you made a big mistake by not hiring you. You're one of the best actors. She just blah, 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 blah. And the movie came out, did nothing. It didn't do anything great. It's called Mm -hmm. Harry and Son. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. But, uh, of course, then Risky Business comes out. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. (laughs) Big, big. Big mistake, as Julia Roberts would say. Big, big mistake. (laughs) And uh, so Tom Cruise becomes Tom Cruise. I'm still struggling, marrying, having babies, acting, struggling, kids, marrying, having babies. In and out and out. 30 years later, Mm -hmm. I'm working the Oscars. I'm rehearsing it. There's a group of rehearsal actors that rehearse the show because it goes live. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I'm sitting in the producer seat of Kathleen Kennedy. My cohort is sitting in the seat of Steven Spielberg for Best Picture Mm -hmm. War Horse that Mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Well, who's presenting Best Picture on the Oscars that year is Tom Cruise. Oh, wow. So I'm going, wait, are we going to win? Because every every day leading up to the Oscars, a different Best Picture wins to help the camera guy practice following mm. the person. So every everyone gets a chance to win. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I going to go up on stage and Tom's going to hand me an Oscar on the Oscar stage right now? This is going to be friggin' awesome. <laughs> so what does he say? The Oscar goes to, for this rehearsal only... War Horse, Kathleen Kennedy, and Steven Spielberg. So we have to pretend to win and run down. And Tom hands me the Oscar and he goes, wait, how do I, you look, wait, what? And so now I'm telling him, now I'm on camera. Yeah. The producers and the directors are in the truck watching me chat up Tom Cruise. Yeah, right. While my, while my Steven Spielberg is at the mic accepting his fake Oscar. And I'm trying to tell Tom, hey, I got to go do, so I go do my thing. Mm-hmm. And then we walk off the stage chatting. He's going, oh, my God, you look amazing. And we had this great little reunion live on the Oscar stage after he handed me an Oscar after 30 years of the Paul Newman thing. Oh, my God. That's so cool. Full circle. That's a great story. I don't even want to ask you any more questions now because that was such a great story. To like. <laughs> but I will I will ask a couple closing questions. Um, so first, sure. I just want to know if you have any uh, upcoming appearances at any more horror cons that you know of yet for this year. Uh, I've heard rumor of Showboat. Was that in July? Yes. Okay, so I've heard rumor they're trying to get a Just One of the Guys reunion. Oh, great. And some more uh, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw 3. So we'll see. That's what that's what I've heard so far for me. Okay, and uh, before I officially let you go, can you plug your social media for everybody so that they can follow you? And when you do find out, you can let everybody know. Yeah, absolutely. So Tony Hudson 9, the number 9, and Tony with an I mind you. Yes. Tony Hudson nine, um, is, uh, my Instagram and then just Tony Hudson, uh, is my Facebook. And, uh, that's really all I do. I'm not, I don't really do TikTok. I don't really do Twitter. I do, I do IG and Facebook. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. You are such a sweetheart. This was great. Oh, and I do have Tony Hudson.com, which is being built right now, but it is my personal website and it'll be where you can contact me because I, I, <laughs> I also have a book called, um, how I found myself with correct living, which is, I have a healthy lifestyle and I teach people how to live a consciously proactive preventative lifestyle through food. And so, um, I do that as well. And my book is an audio book. So you can listen to my story and how I did that over 40 years ago. Wow. So yeah, but it's another thing I do and you can have access to coaching acting wise and all that stuff on my website. So Tony as well. I am interested in a lot of those things. So I will be checking out that website. Awesome. It's well, being built. So it's not all the content's not there, but it's, it's getting there. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Robbie. All right, rockers, once again, Tony Hudson from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3, Uninvited. 
course, we talked about all of her soap opera, TV. That Tom Cruise story was so great. So great. I, I really hope you guys enjoyed this interview. And of course, we'll keep you posted too whenever we do an interview with somebody who does horror conventions or any kind of conventions. We like to let you guys know where they'll be appearing and when. And make sure you're following her on social media. Make sure you're following us on social media and you are subscribed to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. So thank you guys for joining us once again. And we will catch you next week on the All Bets Are Off podcast. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.